Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. This is episode 23 of Midnight Chats. Uh, welcome and thank you for listening and Thanks too to those who checked out Samuel T. Herring from Future Island speaking to Stuart on the last podcast. Um, if you haven't heard it yet, I do recommend going back and listening. Um, he was a really entertaining, engaging, honest guy. And while you're there, if you do listen to that one and you do like what you hear on Midnight Chats, you can subscribe to our podcast. That means you'll automatically get a new episode, a new one of these, every time we publish one at midnight every two weeks. So on to this new one. Last week I went to meet up with Gillian Banks, uh, better known by her stage name, Banks, in a London hotel room before her show at the Roundhouse in Camden. It was the final night of the Californian artist's headline European tour. It's the first one she's done since she released her second album, The Altar, in the autumn of last year. And... To be honest, uh, Banks doesn't do a huge amount of press. Um, There's not an awful lot of information, um, interviews, things like that out there with her. She's quite private. She's quite an enigmatic artist. And we've wanted to have her on Midnight Chats for a while because I think that's um, part of of her appeal um, is, is, is everything that she kind of creates around the music that she makes. I suppose I went there hoping to find out a bit more about Gillian Banks and um, I'll let you be the judge of, of whether that happened or not. So in person, Banks was really lovely, but um, she says it herself in this in this conversation that you're about to hear that she's very protective over her music and it comes from a very deeply personal place. And it's something that you might hear artists say regularly um, that they prefer that their music do the talking. But I think that's certainly the case with Banks. I think that's certainly her preference is to is to let the songs that she's written really kind of speak for her. Um, After all, this is an artist who who says she wrote her first songs as a necessary form of escape. Um, It took her almost a decade before she'd actually go on to share them publicly. But we talked about a range of things, uh, like her visits to London to record her early music uh, and her memories of doing that, handling the psychological effects, um, often quite difficult to deal with, uh, of the day-to-day being out on the road touring. She's very honest about that. How she feeds her inspiration uh, to keep making music, where she'd like to travel um, outside of you know, the world tours that she does support in the music, and why she'd never write a song and give it away to another artist. Um, so, so if you don't know Banks, um, this isn't going to tell you everything you need to know about her, but it might tell you a little bit more, and hopefully um, this will be an interesting listen. This is Midnight Chats, episode 23, with Banks. Thanks. Hello. Welcome to Midnight Chats. Thank Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're back in London, which mm-hmm. is, um, I imagine, a place that you kind of have fond memories of, um, having been here a number of times over the years, mm-hmm. but also um, recorded some of your first music, I guess, yeah. over here. Yeah. So what's it like being back in town? Feels good. It's pretty emotional being it's the last, uh, you know, the last show of this tour and this is the first tour of this album so it's been really intense and a lot of growth and it feels good it's I'm very I feel I feel quite nervous for the show tonight actually oh really <laughs> yeah a even though bit. you've been playing the set kind of was yeah. a couple of weeks now right yeah mm. I sometimes I get like that though like I'll be really good and then one random show I'll just feel a lot of anxiety over and then once I'm on stage I'm good but it's a crazy thing being on stage. Mm. Can it happen kind of randomly, or is it? Do you think it's maybe something to do with being in London and knowing the city and maybe having friends here? Is it like maybe? I think um, my nerves are also dependent on my exhaustion level. <laughs> so, like, it's almost like the more tired I am, the more sensitive I am, the more nervous I get. So, but I know that it'll be great. I'm, you know, I'm just excited to be here. London is just definitely a special place for me. You know, my first EP was called London because I made the whole thing here. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of where my music was first embraced. So 
I'm super excited for the show. What are your memories of the first time that you came to London? Was that was that when you actually came to do the recording, or had you been previously? My first time I was in London was actually when I was a bit younger. I came with my mom, but I, I was only here for like two or three days, and you know I was young and I didn't really get to. I think you know when I wrote the London EP, that was my first real time spending real time here, and mm-hmm. it was also a crazy time in my life. I felt like. Um, was like one of those milestones that you think back on as like one of the the turning points where you go through a lot of growth in a really short amount of time and that's what I was feeling just in my personal life at that time and then coming to London and being around artists that thought the same way I did for the first time was just like super crazy I felt I felt like I found my people for the first time in my life so that's kind of what what London was to me and um that's why, you know, when I come back, I, le- I get really excited. Did it take time to kind of meet those people, make those friends, or were you already kind of connected to the people that you knew you sort of had a kindred spirit with over here? It was kind of like these particular few months. Um, I just happened, I think the universe was just looking out for me. I happened to meet all of these r- people that I really connected with in a really short amount of time. And they all happened to be in the UK at the time. So it was kind of like, I was like, okay, let's just make a trip and just like jam it all in in two weeks, two and a half weeks. And so I was like in sessions every day for those two and a half weeks with, it was three people mainly and um, just back to back to back. And it was just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. For those people that don't know that early EP, well, we're talking about people like, totally enormous extinct dinosaur Mm -hmm. and um, it's always a mouthful I'm glad I got it right there (laughs) and Son who um, was there as well and Um, Lil Silva yeah so how how was it meeting those people for the first time and what kind of connection have you got to have with somebody in order to make music with them because it's not as easy as just walking into a studio and immediately oh my god no you have it's special it's like when it's like kind of like dating almost it's like two souls that come together and you just some, it's funny because sometimes you can really vibe with someone at one point in your life and then a few years later it's like maybe like our paths have like drifted or something like it's it's a really magical time when two creative like souls can come together and create something together mm-hmm. and be on the same wavelength it's kind of like you're at that similar point in your life where um, it just works and, and that kind of happened with all of those people and they're dear to me still and um so yeah it was awesome deep question considering we've only just started but do you sort of believe that fate sort of had something to do with that because you've been making music um you know for almost a decade but not necessarily kind of sharing it with the outer world and like you said those sort of ingredients came together and you felt at ease here in London to write that music and I don't know if the word what the word fate means even I think it was definitely it had to do with me finally being open like finally putting myself out there um and then it yeah I definitely think you know it takes a lot of hard work and a a lot of you have to have it you know you have to like believe and know who you are as an artist but then it, it always takes a little bit of extra fairy dust in the end and I think that I definitely had that with me yeah and I still do the fact that I'm still doing this so um yeah I don't know, fate, something like that. Yeah, I felt like the universe was definitely like pushing me in the right direction. It's like I've I've always followed my gut. That's like the most in, my music comes from my gut, and then I've always followed my gut, and especially in terms of like making decisions for my career and who I feel like working with and who, um, and just the, any decision that I make. So it's almost like this. Like, I'm always, like, lured towards the right thing, maybe. Mm-hmm. And even if it ends up being the wrong thing, it was still the right thing. Because if it's, if it's a decision made by following your gut, then you can't really fault yourself for it. I'm a great believer in that. I think it's totally yeah. true. I've always, even if I've made wrong decisions, when I have followed my gut, I sort of have um, confidence in the decision that I made yeah. anyway because I know why I made it. Yeah. Sometimes it's funny, like, if you're going through a period of self-doubt or or just anything you find yourself asking other people's opinions but always always at the end of the day I like for me even when I've gone through 
periods where I, if I'm doubting myself or something and I ask like six different people what they think, I never end up listening. So it's almost just like a journey to get back to your own mind. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You mentioned earlier that this is the first kind of big um, headline tour run that you've done in support of the altar. Mm. Um, How has it been playing those songs every night? Oh, my gosh. Feels so good. I feel like I went through a lot in between albums mentally just to try and get my... I wanted to enjoy this new life of mine more um, because I had kind of a tough time with it, the first album. And... Um, I think I've grown so much and I've my 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 music has grown and my what I want to do on stage has grown um, and so being able to finally after so long thinking about what I what that meant and what that was going to be and then rehearsing and then like you know letting my mind free creatively and letting myself be as you know taking risks and challenging myself like I've really done that for this tour and this live show and it feels so good and it's the most fun I've ever had the show is so fun for me to do like I I I genuinely enjoy being on stage every single second that I'm there because I'm really inspired by what I'm doing right now and sometimes when you're you like especially with album cycles because you know this is only my second album I'm still like I still think of myself as a newcomer in this business because there are people who have put out six, seven, eight albums, whatever. But I have to imagine that what I felt but at the end of the goddess era, which is like you've been performing these songs for three years and mm. some of their meanings have changed to you. And, and some some shows can start feeling quite robotic. like, mm-hmm. And finally... And when that starts happening is kind of when you know, okay, artistically, I'm, I need to do something else. Like, I need to write. I need to I need to reinvigorate myself creatively and feel really inspired again. And so, you know, giving myself the time to write this album and then th- really think about creatively what I want to do for it and visually and, and live show-wise, it's like, it's so new and it's so fresh for me and I feel so inspired by it right now. So it's making it really fun. Mm. I often think it's an interesting situation when an artist um, enjoys more success and plays bigger shows because inevitably when you have a bigger stage you fill it with a bigger production which means more people are involved which means that um, in a sense it has to become more organised and choreographed and like you say it it could end up being a bit um, robotic because there are cues and there are visuals and and there are lights that have to appear at the right moments so how do you still find the kind of essence in your live performance so that every night it feels different and it feels Um, because every movement you know when you think when I think of the word like choreography it almost feels like there's someone who's coming in it almost feels like that stereotypical like pop packaging world where it's like someone's coming in from an an outsider is coming in to try and like make you move the way they see fit Mm -hmm. whereas like this show that I'm doing it's like every single creature involved in this show was picked because I believe in them and they inspire me so like these moves that I'm doing are you know from they're like these natural grooves that I just have always done but elevated and the people that are on stage with me I have you know they represent these you know these two girls Allison and Nadine who I've taken on the road with me it's just been so much fun because I mean my music I write all my music it all comes from my heart and so like when I move to it it comes from inside of me and then like when you when you find people that really understand you and and you connect with and you're inspired by and then they kind of like you're kind of doing all these grooves together that that the music is naturally doing to you it it feels really organic and authentic and it just feels like the next step for me um and Nina McNeely is kind of my partner in that and she's she's choreographed this crazy she knows me so well and 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 we've you know she's like my soulmate movement wise Mm -hmm. like my I don't know it's good when you find people who inspire you it doesn't feel like a robotic thing it feels like every night that I've done this show so far every movement feels like this like gritty kind of like guttural thing and it, and it grows and it changes every night and the audience changes every night and and it's um my mood changes every night I mean like I said today I'm feeling a bit nervous and tired or something 
and you know on another day I could have just been like in a really like loud goofy mood so like that would kind of go into my performance so sometimes you feel more fragile sometimes you feel more of more like a warrior and that kind of um affects your performance so it's always I'm just like I'm just a human that makes music and performs it so it changes every night how are you now that you've done it for four or five years Mm -hmm. um like going on the road that thing of um performing every night moving to a different city doing it again repeat 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 in the sort of genuine day-to-day detail how do you find that because it's not um you know we've spoken to artists on the podcast before who said they love every moment of touring but only the bit where they're on stage and the rest of it they can kind of take or leave really um because it's hard and they don't they struggle to find the kind of joy in it It might sound uh, um it might sound like uh, it's a great luxury to move between these cities um every day but you don't really get to see any of it and you're really just kind of hopping from one hotel room to the next and then performing Mm. so like the actual day-to-day it's quite grueling so how do you find it it's hard. To, I mean, I had a re- like I said, the fr- my first album. I I did not. I would. I was. I didn't get how people did this. It's. Are you, can you like sometimes like cuss? Is that allowed you on this? Thing? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember thinking like, how the fuck do people do this? Like I didn't understand how. Like I would talk to my friends who had you know been touring for years, and I'm like, but how? Like I don't understand. I was completely miserable. And I felt like shit, and like it's unhealthy, and your body's on different time zones, and you're homesick, and and you know you you don't understand the language, so you think you you know said something or ordered something, and it's wrong, and then you only have a minute to get to sound check, and then you only have this long, and then you're late for your show, and then the, you know it's just it's really hard, and it, it is a grind, and and for me, what I've learned is like the most important thing is having the right energies around you, the right people around you, because. If someone doesn't understand um, what, who you are, and like, the, I'm just any artist or any person needs the right people around them, especially when you're in a, when you're exhausted and you're traveling and you need a lot of positive energy and a lot of like um, nurturing energy. Mm. Um, and when I realize that now, the crew I have around me now is. Um, has completely changed my entire experience of touring. Mm. <clears throat> like, this is the most fun tour I've ever been on, for sure. Yeah. I'm just having such a good time because, first of all, the, the longer you do it, the more of a routine you can somehow find within having no routine. Like, um, and just, yeah, like I said, just having the right people around you, it's kind of as simple and as hard as that. Mm. Often when people talk about artists' careers, they say, um, what an incredible thing to be able to travel the world. And uh, as I said earlier, like, yes, you are in the sense that you're kind of moving from one place to another mm-hmm. but um, and playing shows every night, but never necessarily seeing a place. So are you away from touring and away from making music? Are you kind of an adventurous spirit anyway? Do you, do you like travelling? Do you like seeing new things? Is that like yeah. something that you're really keen on and regardless of the big cities that you play every night, is there somewhere in the world that you'd love to go to? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone could do this if they weren't an adventurous spirit because it's just, you're in, you're out of your element so often um, that you would go insane if you weren't. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I love, I get so bored. Like, I get bored really easily. And if I'm not inspired, sometimes I feel like uninspired and bored are similar words. If I'm either of those things, I feel like my skin turns gray. Like, I just become, like, I feel like I don't feel good. And so, for me, touring does kind of fill that hole sometimes. And um, a place that I definitely would want to go to is India. Mm -hmm. What attracts you about the idea of going to India? Is it the kind of... Just like the colors, the food, the people, everything. Yeah. It just looks so beautiful. Every single thing I've read about it, I've seen um, the culture. I've just never been anywhere like it. Mm. My wife's just come back from India. Really? She worked in a... Um, uh, she volunteered in a children's orphanage oh, wow. for 10 days. And it was the first time she'd been to India and she was she was in Delhi. 
and uh, she had an incredible experience. Yeah. Like, she can't wait to go back. Yeah, everyone I've talked to who has been there. And I don't know if I've ever talked to someone who's played there even. Mm. I, I feel like everyone I've talked to has just gone there as a just an experience. But it's funny because I was touring for, you know, I toured the Goddess album for like three years. And then um, anytime my dad or my mom or a friend or something would be like, do you want to get out of town for a few days? I'd be like, absolutely not. Like, if I'm not forced to be on a plane I'll never step on a plane but then I took a trip to Italy with my family um, before the altar came out and it was the first trip I had gone on that wasn't like for work or for touring or for shows or whatever and I was like whoa like it's so different like I completely <laughs> forgot that like this is what holiday is yeah <laughs> like you think you're it's like you trick yourself into thinking you're on holiday but you're absolutely not yeah. like um, so where did you go in Italy? Was it? Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah, um, we went to a few different places. We were in Positano, which was incredible, mm -hmm. and then yeah, we just kind of ventured around. But nice. yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful country, Italy. Yeah, I'd like to go there more. I've only ever really been yeah. to Rome and Venice. Venice, I would highly recommend. It's a yeah. pretty crazy place. Yeah, it's, that's come it's out nice. of somebody's imagination at some point. Yeah, it feels. It, it seems fake or something. Yeah. yeah. What is life like when you go back home now? Then do you find is it is it got still got a sort of magnetic pull when you're when you're out on the road, or do you, do you still do you enjoy like going home and like the comforts and the friends and the family? Is that an important thing still? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you need that. Uh, when I'm on tour after three weeks, I start saying I need to go home, and then when I'm at home for longer than three weeks, I say I need to go on tour. Yeah. So it's like I'm constantly unsatisfied. <laughs> <laughs> What's um. You mentioned the trying to constantly feed like your inspiration, and to make sure you know um, yeah. your, your your kind of own well being is you know, dependent on that. Yeah. Um, how do you ensure that you do that? How do you how do you how do you keep feeding your inspiration? I that makes it sound a like a kind of an animal no, or a pet. No, but I or think a lot it? of it is the people who you surround yourself with. Okay. Like I've really been learning that so much more than ever the last year and a half or so because. Um, people's minds are the most intricate things in the world and if somebody is like um if you're around people who you connect with and inspire you then maybe they'll show you something mm -hmm. show you a dancer that you're in that they're into or show you a movie or you know an exhibit or i, I don't know or even just hanging out with some you know it's it's more just like having fun is really inspiring it's not it's not as much so about like it's not always so obvious as like let's go to an art exhibit or like let's like listen to this amazing song or watch this amazing movie like for me it's not really like that like if I'm like excited by my own life that's inspiring to me it's it's yeah it's more about that do you listen to music when you're on the road other people's music you know, I I do, but I'm. <laughs> I sometimes feel so like people think I'm nuts when I say this, but I actually like when I'm writing an album and when I'm like doing shows night after night during the day. I actually don't really listen to music. Mm -hmm. I kind of like it to be quiet, almost like even when I'm getting ready for shows, I just like it, like a quiet. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's funny the things that people help to get themselves into that zone to be able to write. Um, I interviewed a guy called Reggie Snow, who's, mm. who's, a, who's from Dublin. He's a rapper. And uh, he makes kind of, um, you know, Kendrick Lamar-esque kind of hip-hop, I suppose. Mm. But when he writes, um, he said he always sits down and he always puts on classical jazz. Like, you know... Interesting. And he's like, that's what I need. It's basically this. Yeah. It's my equivalent of kind of silence or that sort of blanket noise that I need in order to concentrate wow. and I was like that's, that's interesting because you're constantly writing um, you're not just writing lyrics you're kind of you're, you're, you know, he's thinking about how he's going to deliver them and the kind of pace and the rhythm and all of those sort of things and yet he's kind of got jazz on in the background mm. and I was kind of like I'd be totally distracted by that I think yeah but yeah everybody has their own way I think a lot of it also has to do with how you got into music mm. like I got into music because I needed an outlet so bad. So, and I taught, you know, I, I never took lessons. I never went to school for it. I never 
you know, took piano lessons or singing lessons or anything. And, like, it all came so from this, like, necessity of exhaling out all of this heavy gravity that was extra on my shoulders. And so it comes more from my gut. What, like, I'm sure, not, not saying that that person's doesn't come. I'm just saying, like, for me, it's like if, a like, three chords will start is, like, the atmosphere that I need. I just need, like, a cozy studio with, like, you know, a mood of some sort, whatever I'm in, and then it just takes some sort of, like, it always starts with, like, a melodic chant, like an almost meditative chant. There's a part in my show where I kind of go through the motions of how I make a song, but it always starts with that, with, some, like, a chant, a me melodic chant. Um Let's talk about the altar for a moment. Uh, how did you feel about the kind of reception um, to that album, and m most specifically the kind of conversations that you've had with um, your fans about songs on the album? Like when you meet people, what have, what have the conversations been like with your fans about the album? Mm, just some. I don't know how much they connect to it. I try not to focus on the reception of my music. To be honest, I I I mean I know I seeing people scream my lyrics at these shows has been incredible and fulfilling but uh, yeah I think it's been great I think it's been awesome I'm just focusing on how I feel about it yeah yeah and how do you feel about it sort of six months on after the release of it I feel good I feel I'm protective of it and proud of it and um, excited by it. Yeah, you've still got like a kind of great connection to it because often people kind of are one step ahead of things and you'll already be thinking about the music that you want to write next. Are you that kind of person or are you still living with that album at the moment? Well, I'm always making music and I don't think about music in terms of albums. So it's more about like each song has its own little meaning or big meaning um, and I think you know every time it's like you get it you're getting to I'm still getting to know them I've, you know when I perform I'm still getting to know the songs and um, but I'm always writing songs but you, they're not mutually exclusive like you don't have to if you're making music you can't still live with the other music you've made so I'm I'm living with this music and I'm I'm still learning the ins and outs of you know the dimensions of performing each song and and how I want to move to them and how they make me feel different depending on what night I'm singing them and all that yeah and you've talked in the past about how making music for you is a kind of intensely personal thing so would you ever if you wrote a song and you didn't um you didn't like it anymore or you didn't feel it, it worked for you would you ever give it away would you ever give it to another artist Um, I don't know. I've been asked that question so many times, and some days when I'm asked it, I'm like, no, I would never. And then some days I'm like, that maybe that sounds naive, and I should like think more about it before I respond so abruptly. But I don't know. If it feels, if I wrote something like really personal, like about my life, I would never like. I couldn't like it. it I don't know. It, it would have to. I would have to like remove. If I was writing a song, no, I'm just. I just can't imagine doing it. I, like, cause I don't write. I write about my own personal life, and it's always. It always means a lot to me when I make something. If I were to ever write something ahead of time for somebody else. And they they said like I want to write a song about this. Then like that would, I guess I could potentially think about it. But that's not even how I write. Like it would probably be a shit song, because that sounds like a really heartless way to make music. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I can't really imagine it. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> completely understandable. Because it might be, it would when you put all of your kind of um, your personal kind of experience and feeling to hear those words being come out of somebody else's mouth might be. I would be like. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, finally, then the this 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 year ahead, like kind of you 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 said that this is the the 
the most you've enjoyed touring mm-hmm. um, and you've been, been playing those songs um, from the altar every night what are you most looking forward to about the rest of 2017 mm, just more growth learning just make more music and perform more I'm just excited I love what I do it's I'm really blessed I feel I'm so grateful to do this I know that it's you know it's pretty special being able to travel and and sing songs that I'm that I wrote Mm -hmm. so um I'm just looking forward to doing more of that Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com. Midnight Chats.